So now this evening's guest um, is talking about plants that I think a lot of us call weeds. Uh, weeds are always interesting. Every garden has a different flora uh -huh. of weeds and very often different parts of the garden have their different floras. Um, more generously, perhaps, we should be calling these spontaneous plants. And I think a lot of us do have a fascination with seeing plants growing in extraordinary places, unlikely places, inhospitable places, in cities. Uh, we really admire those uh, little things that just suddenly appear in paving stones um, and walls and these hostile urban environments. Um, Victor Peterson has made a, a special study of these. Uh, he's a Dutch botanist. Um, and his area of main interest has been the Schildersweg, uh, which is inner city, the Hague. Uh, so we think of the Hague as being this kind of very posh Dutch capital city, but it's like any big city, it's got its inner city areas. And Schildersweg uh, is uh, a multicultural area, it's quite a poor area. Um, it's not a very green area, uh, but Vic, uh, Vic has found a lot of greenery there, so much so that he's actually written a book about and have you got your book to hand to wave around uh, to the audience? Uh, my book. <laughs> your book. Yes, your book. Man. Uh, <laughs> yes, I've got it. <laughs> this is it. I this is know. it. Yeah, that yeah. killed us, babe. So yeah. um, it's really, so I think over to you to tell us about the flora of inner city The Hague and what that means to you and I think what it means for society generally. Yes, thank you Noel and thank you very much for inviting me to your, um, to your uh, uh, blog. Um, well, um, we're, gonna to, we're going to talk about um, the Schilderswijk today and um, uh, I tend to call the city the new wilderness. We have a lot of uh, areas over here in Holland uh, where they develop nature, but in effect they are trying to recreate nature that was um, lost due to developments in agriculture or um, in, in, in urban areas. And uh, in effect the city is a really uh, unique place in which plants are pushed to their limits but there are also a lot of possibility for, for, for possibilities for plants. Um, I'm living in the Schilderswijk. And um, actually uh, seven years ago, I uh, uh, started to uh, in, quite intensively look at the plants that are growing in the Schilderswijk. Uh, I started because I, in, uh, I noticed that there were a lot of plants over there. And also, uh, I found several times, I found, I, I found quite rare plants. And I got curious about the amount of plants that grow in the Schilderswijk. And um, also what species are growing there. Uh, so seven years, uh, I, seven years ago, I started just walking around and photographing and collecting all the plants and drying them for, to, to make a herbarium. I can show you on the, on my small, this is for example, a, a herbarium leaf of a plant I collected last week. So I'm still collecting and finding plants. And uh, I found uh, over 500 different species uh, as of yet. So that's quite a lot if you consider that it's, as you can see on this uh, background photo, is quite an urban area and there are not a lot of places for plants to grow, but there's still enough room in between the, the, the street tiles and the wall, as you can see uh, over here on the, uh, on, the, on the picture where I'm, uh, I'm trying to photograph uh, a small plant. It's actually uh, uh, makes for good conversation. Uh, Henk, je moet je presentatie nog even delen. Oh, I thought I shared it. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, share screen. Yeah. Minimize video, sorry. Uh, share screen. Uh, share. Yes. We're getting there, we're getting there. Ah, great. <laughs> I got worried over there, sorry. 
but so uh, as you can see, I'm uh, I'm a lot of a uh, lot of lot of the time I'm uh, on the on the on the pavement like this, photographing and collecting plants, and actually that makes for good con uh, conversation because a lot of people are asking what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm quite uh, noticeable when I'm photographing on the street. And uh, the funny thing is, uh, and I should collect them, but I haven't started with that uh, yet. A lot of people uh, from, uh, because it's a very ethnic diverse neighborhood. So a lot of people tend to tell me stories about plants from their native countries. And um, actually when I started, I thought they were uh, quite uh not so fond of the of, of of the plants that are growing in between the pavements that they found it quite messy but actually they they quite like those plants growing there uh, uh urban uh, botany in general is quite um a new uh, yeah a new segment of of botany and that is mainly due to the fact that we changed the way uh, we maintain our streets. Uh, in the past, we used a lot of uh, herbicides to kill off the plants. And so the streets were very clean and the herbicides always also uh, 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 damage the soil in between the tiles a lot. So, so nothing could grow there. But uh, since uh, a couple of years, it's prohibited. So that, that gave a lot of plants the chance to uh, to yeah grow in our city neighborhoods and um, uh, that's that's also the case in the Schilderswijk and the Schilderswijk is actually is is, is uh, uh, the main part of the Schilderswijk is quite new it was uh, originally mainly built in the 1930s but the, the houses were such poor quality that in the, the 80s and the 90s, they started to demolish it. And that also changed the, the demography of the, the neighborhood. So there are a lot of uh, different cultures living in the Schilderswijk uh, at the moment, about 125 different nationalities. And they also tend to play a role in the plants that I find here in the, in the neighborhood. But uh, I'll come back to that later. Um, well, the Schilderswijk is, is a quite an urbanized and stony area. So it's very, uh, it, it's at first glance, it seems a very unlikely place to find plants. Uh, but we tend to underestimate plants because plants are very resourceful uh, and uh, they find ways to to grow so you have the different uh, places where you can they can grow on walls in between the tiles in in little green areas around trees uh, and the most unlikely place i found some plants was um, in a in a sign it was a sign of plexiglass two sheets of plexiglass and actually there were pigeons uh, a lot of the time on top of the of the the sign and the sign was open on the top and the pigeons they pooped in in between the sheets of plexiglass so you get you've got uh yeah a, a soil in 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 between the plexiglass and i actually i i never noticed those plants until i began to investigate bats in my uh, neighborhood and in the in the sign in between the sheets of plexiglass there's a light and that goes on in at night so when it goes on in at, 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 at in the evening you can see actually can see the plants growing in between the sheets of plexiglass so that that illustrates how resourceful plants are and how little some species need to grow uh, on this page, you can see uh, some of the plants I've uh, collected and uh, I've been uh, uh, yeah, uh, drying and uh, creating my herbarium, which, which will um, go to uh, the um, Museum of Natural History in Rotterdam in, uh, in, in I think we'll, we'll, uh, I'll bring it over there next year because uh, I've practically 
finished in my opinion now in in in, in the Schilderswijk and there are not a lot of plants I new plants I find so it's it's a little bit depleted in 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 that sense I, I tend to in in the beginning I found dozens of plants a day and now I tend to find two or three in in the weekend when I go and make uh, my rounds uh, this is a little overview of uh, how the Schilderswijk looks. This is actually quite uh, a typical crossing in the in the Schilderswijk. You see, it's very busy, and uh, at first glance, you don't see any small plants growing there. But when you look a little little bit further and a little bit deeper. Uh, and you go a little bit more in the back alleys, you can see that, for example, these little posts, abandoned um, uh, uh, bicycles and stuff like that, they protect, actually protect a little bit uh, the, the, the growing space for plants and they can actually flour flourish over there, as you can see. Uh, so there are several, well, at least, I think a dozen of or so species growing in between these posts over here. So it's 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 a question if you do urban botany to look at the places where there's a little bit less traffic, a little bit less people walking. It's also very uh, when I discuss this with, uh, for example, our our uh, urban uh, ecologist who's uh, in. Uh, uh, who's in the municipality. I always try to emphasize that where there is, uh, uh, where there are plants growing, the pavement actually isn't used that often. So it's, it's also a good way of uh, looking at places where you can remove pavement or can make the, the roads a little bit uh, narrower or something like that. Um, well, I've um, I've made this presentation a little bit about uh, around how plants tend to travel and come into urban areas. Uh, in the beginning of urban uh, botany, there was a very big emphasis on harbors and industrial areas because there was a lot of uh, traffic from abroad coming in there. So a lot of new plants tend to find their way into those areas by uh, trucks or uh, uh, other ways and um, uh, well several years ago uh, I and a, uh, in my uh, wake a small group of urban botanists started to uh, look at these multicultural areas because um, well I found a lot of um, um, quite special plants for Holland over here. There are actually five plants I found in the Schilderswijk, which is only 1.2 square kilometers. So it's, a, it's quite a small area. And I actually find five new plants that were never found in Holland before. So that um, made us, uh, got us thinking about how plants get into these areas and um, uh, what we can learn from it. And um, one of the ways that uh, plants can get here, and this is, uh, I, I, I translate as uh, terms we, we thought of, uh, urban botanists uh, thought of here in Holland. And one of the ways uh, that uh, plants get here is by being edible. Uh, and we call those plants Kitchen, kitchen fledglings, so they flee from the kitchen and they find their way uh, onto our streets and sometimes uh, yeah they can uh, they can take over uh, quite some quite some areas sometimes they're very hard to find out what kinds of plants they are and for example this is uh, black cumin uh, nigella sativa and uh, this is a plant from uh, the Middle East. Uh, it was used uh, in, in the past, widely used in, in Iraq, Iran. But it's also quite uh, intensively used in, in Turkey. And uh, I first found these plants around Turkish bakeries. 
and uh, uh, that got me wondering uh, what they used it for. So I entered one day, I entered a Turkish uh, a bakery and I asked uh, if they could tell me uh, if, if, if they are using this plant and what they're using it for. And they told me that actually this plant is used on Turkish bread. So you have sesame seeds on the Turkish bread, but you have also small black seeds on the Turkish bread. And actually that is black cumin. So this is a plant you can find uh, almost exclusively in, in, in these multicultural areas where they use a lot of uh, uh, black cumin. It's actually a uh, family of the Nigella we use quite often in, in, in our gardens. That one is blue and has, uh, is, is a little bit different uh, in its appearance as well. It's, it's, it's more sturdy. But um, you can also see on the, on, on the picture, on, on the right pic right hand picture, not, not the herbarium picture, but the other one, that uh, it's, it's quite a small plant and it has, it has a really hard time in the neighborhood to maintain itself. It, it, it flowers and it makes seeds and I find it on, in the same areas every year, but it's, 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 it, it has a hard time. And this year I haven't found it yet and that's, uh, prep, uh, this uh, uh, mainly due to the the harsh winter we had this year. So many of these plants are are uh, yeah are very uh, unlikely to survive uh, frost. Another plant we found and this is actually was was quite a difficult plant for us to get a name uh, of because uh, we it actually took us one and a half year and. Um, Another friend of mine actually tracked this code, Niels Eimers, is also a botanist. Uh, this is a plant from Northern India. It's also a Kitchland fledgling. And uh, when I found this plant, I, I cracked my head what it could be, but you don't normally look into a Northern India uh, uh, flora to find plants that are growing in your own neighborhood. So, this one was very, very hard to, to, to come by. This one actually is still growing uh, on the same place in the Rosenburgstraat. And uh, it also tells you uh, uh, a little bit about uh, the, the demography of, of the neighborhood. So you can actually, some plants you can see from, oh, that's, that's mainly a Turkish neighborhood, or that's mainly an uh, uh, Indian neighborhood, or that's mainly... Uh, uh, for example, uh, an, uh, a neighborhood where there's a lot of uh, Hindus living, and that's 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 quite nice as well that you can see the influence of of of, of the people who are living there and the uh, the, the, the plants they are using. So this was quite a uh, for us. This was quite a special find. It was only the first third find of of this plant in in Holland. And uh, it's actually the the only place uh, in Holland where it's uh, maintaining itself for uh, multiple years. Uh, another plant that's uh, used a lot in uh, Middle Eastern kitchens is uh, 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 fenugreek. It's um, um, uh, a plant that's used uh, um, uh, in, in, in several uh, dishes. And uh, this is an example of a plant that isn't maintaining itself. It's sometime introduced. So I, I find it from time to time and it sets seeds, but it, it, it doesn't uh, germinate. So it's, it, I think it's a little bit too cold for this plant to, um, to maintain itself and to, to, to really develop. <clears throat> but still, it's 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 a nice example of of, of kitchen fledglings. It's it's found uh, actually all over Holland from time to time. So there are multiple finds of this plant. But well, it doesn't propagate. So it's 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 really reliant on people to reintroduce it after it's left. <clears throat> Another very interesting way, in my opinion, that plants get to this neighborhood is via uh, uh, religion. That seems a very surprising way for plants to travel. 
But uh, when I started in, 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 in several uh, areas of the neighborhood, I found uh, a lot of marigolds and African marigolds. And um, I also noticed that there was a lot of mar marigold and African marigold in uh, people's gardens. So uh, at a certain moment in time, I stopped. I saw somebody working in this garden. And I asked them what uh, what they use this plants for the marigold and the African marigold. And uh, they actually told me that there are used in Hindu offerings. <clears throat> so um, these plants they 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 cut they cut off the flower heads, and then they they uh, yeah they offer them um, mainly in water, but also uh, sometimes in the bushes with a little bit of milk and 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 stuff like that. And those plants they just fl uh, flee from the gardens and they 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 maintain themselves quite uh, easily and happily as you can see on the on the on the photo on the right it's 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 growing just merrily in between the uh, in between the, uh, the the pavement stones and <clears throat> i never imagined that religion could be a way that plants can uh, can can travel from a to b actually but it's a it's a real it's a real nice uh, and surprising ways for plants to, um, yeah, to 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 reach this neighborhood, and it also just like the <clears throat> the plant, the kitchen fledglings tells us something about uh, <clears throat> the people that live in that certain street and certain area. That's something I I always find very interesting and very surprising about how much influence we have in, in, in uh, transporting plants and how much plants depend, plants depend on us to, 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 to get to other areas. Another way that, uh, and not such a surprising way that plants travel is our, uh, is our gardens. And we tend to collect a lot of plants in our gardens and we like diversity in our gardens. And from time to time, we plant plants in our gardens that can just jump the fence and uh, yeah, merrily live on the street. Um, this is also a way of, uh, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, collecting that started quite early uh, in the Renaissance, uh, when the first botanical gardens, for example, in Pisa were, uh, were uh, uh, founded, but also here in Holland in, in, in Leiden, the Hortus Botanicus, where Clusius actually was, um, was uh, 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 head gardener, well, not really head gardener, but head of the collection, actually. <clears throat> and uh, he started to collect um, a lot of plants. He was very well connected uh, in Vienna. And via Vienna, he had a, a, a direct link to Turkey. So that was actually the start of us collecting uh, special plants. And we still are very uh, focused on um, yeah, on, on exotic and, and rare plants in our gardens. Uh, one of the first examples of this is uh, the tall flea bane. And the tall flea bane is actually a plant that we don't use that often in our gardens anymore, but was uh, already introduced into our gardens somewhere in the, in the 15th or 16th century. So it has been here for a long, long time. It's actually quite rare in Holland, but it, 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 you, can, you tend to find it from time to time. And it just has integrated into our, uh, into our flora. Uh, it has been here for such a long time that it's now considered uh, somewhat indigenous. Uh, and as I said, quite, quite rare. But this is an example of a very, very early uh, 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 garden plant. And, uh, these plants like, like, like this and also um, uh, old medicinal plants, uh, I think of as a sort of a, 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 a monu monument like a church. A church can tell us something about our history, but plants we tend to find in our surroundings also can tell us a lot about, uh, about our history. 
we tend to walk by them and don't notice them, but actually there are sometimes there are quite uh, surprising and long histories attached to them and to ourselves. So that's that's very that's a very interesting um, aspect about plants. And I think we should take more notice of, of the role that plants have played in, in, in our history, not only the things we have built, built, but also the things we have brought over here and that still are here among us. Uh, another plant that I found find uh, quite often uh, uh, in, in, in the Schilderswijk is the, uh, is the Brompton stock. It's uh, a, pl uh, a plant from Southern Europe and there it, uh, it, it grows in between rock crevices. And um, that's actually uh, just as it's growing here, it, it's, it's an artificial rock crevice that we have created in between the pavement stones and, uh, and the wall. And this is a plant also that, that benefits a lot from climate change because it's getting warmer and cities tend to be a little bit warmer than, uh, than uh, uh, non-urbanized areas. So you tend to find a lot of the plants that benefit from, uh, from climate change, you tend to find them first in the city and then they cultivate the rest of, uh, of the country and the countryside. Uh, a plant that also is introduced but is not really considered as something favorable is the Japanese knotweed. It's a very invasive plant. It grows very tall. It can, can grow up to two meters tall. And it, it has a very sturdy root system and it's very hard to eradicate. And uh, the Japanese knotweed is actually a plant that uh, our flora isn't really accustomed to. So it grows so vigorously and so fast that it, it, it can annihilate all local flora because it's, so power, it's such a powerful grower. And uh, I've got uh, an area where it's uh, where uh, several houses were demolished, and it was growing over there in the garden. And they actually piled uh, about a meter of sand on top of these gardens. Then they put pavement on top of it, and uh, the plants after well, I think it's now five years since they've demolished those those houses. The plants are still pushing up the, the the pavement, so that that's really a testament to how incredibly strong and 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 yeah resilient this plant is, and it just doesn't give up. That is a problem in 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 nature, but it also is a little bit humbling that that the despite all the effort we put in we we just don't seem to be able to eradicate uh, uh, a plant like this so you, you can it, it's a testimony about how uh, much plants want plants want to survive and they don't they don't get to choose the place where they grow up so when a seed falls somewhere the plant has to do to do with the circumstances uh, that it's that it gets on its plate, and um, in within the genetic diversity of the plant, there's a lot of uh, solutions for a plant as well to 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 yeah to to change its appearance a little bit, or to become a little bit smaller or a little bit hairier or a little bit uh, silvery silvery or to 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 <clears throat> just uh, yeah try to survive. Vegetable gardens, fledglings. Uh, in the last couple of years, vegetable gardens have become really, really popular in Holland. And uh, you also tend to see some plants from vegetable gardens just fleeing the vegetable garden and, uh, and entering the cities. The pea is a good example of this. Uh, there are actually a, quite a lot of peas growing in the Schilderswijk at one certain place uh, uh, in the tram, uh, tramway. Uh, here you see the, the, the tramway uh, behind the pea on the uh, right photograph. 
and uh, peas are actually uh, have have been in culture very long, so it's it's quite nice to to find them in uh, the neighborhoods and and growing quite merrily and also propagating. So that's 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 a very interesting uh, thing. I haven't found them outside of the city yet, but I think they'll they're here to stay and they'll 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 find their way outside of the city as well because they uh, can deal with a lot more circumstances than uh, certain other plants uh, in the city. Lettuce is, uh, is a plant that we see uh, more and more often as well. Uh, lettuce actually is a, is a plant that has been in culture for a very, very long time. You have uh, Carolinian manuscripts from, uh, from the, the ninth uh, century where it's already uh, described as being in culture uh, and also being used uh, as a medicinal plant. And uh, at first glance, you wouldn't really recognize this as lettuce because normally we tend to have those nice bulbous uh, uh, balls of leaves. But actually when it's, it develops, you can, uh, you can see it grows quite tall and it, it, it yeah, it grows quite merrily in between the street stones as well. Uh, the, another plant is, is the rocket. And um, rockets are uh, uh, introduced a little bit with the Italian kitchen. So when the Italian kitchen became more and more popular, we saw more of, more of uh, this plants in, in the neighborhoods. It's actually a very beautiful plant. The, the flowers, they have, uh, they're a little palish, uh, palish yellow, but they have really small brownish veins uh, on, on, on their uh, petals. And that's, that's, that's quite, uh, quite a nice, uh, nice, nice contrast in, in, in the flower. They can actually, as you can see, they can, can grow uh, pretty big. They're still still considered uh, uh, quite rare in, in in Holland, but with a lot of plants that we find in the city, they're in, in the city. They're very common, but they're only common in the city. So this is a plant that you practically only find in 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 urban areas and and not in the rest of the country. So it it, it stays pretty rare in that uh, respect. Uh, a very old way for plants to travel is uh, by being uh, in uh, sheepskins or wool. Wool was uh, uh, imported uh, from all over the world, actually, and seeds get trapped inside the fleece of the of the sheep. And often these uh, adventures weren't um, uh, washed. And uh, botanists already in the in the in the 19th century were aware of the fact that a lot of plants were coming into the country via wool. So a lot of botanists tended to, to um, uh, visit uh, uh, factories where they processed wool to find new plants. And wool is a way for plants to to travel incredible distances. For example, uh, this narrow leaved ragwort originates from uh, South Africa. And in the 70s, um, uh, there were a few sightings of this plant. And uh, actually, people traveled from all over Holland to, to see botanists travel from all over Holland to, to, to have a look at this plant because it was so rare. And um, Nowadays, it's actually everywhere. It's a very nice plant. It flowers for a long, long time. And it has those little umbrella-like uh, uh, extensions onto their seeds. So with the wind, they can travel quite uh, great distances. <clears throat> and uh, so that's, yeah, it's really surprising that you can find a plant that originates from South Africa, actually growing all over, all the way in, in Holland and growing quite merrily. Uh, another wool advantage, and this is, this is quite a 
funny one. This is the first plant that was uh, of this species that was found in in Holland. Is the African uh, amaranth, amaranth. And uh, I found actually found this plant underneath the balcon balcony. And uh, there are a lot of people here still processing their own sheepskins and wool. And uh, before I found this plant. I actually uh, observed uh, a woman uh, spinning her own wool on that balcony. So I suspect that this plant has been in that bunch, bunch of wool that she, she bought. I don't, I don't know where she got it from. I tried to have uh, a conversation with her, but regret, regrettably she doesn't speak Dutch. So I couldn't, I couldn't really <laughs> have a real conversation with her. And she, I think she doesn't, didn't really understand my enthusiasm about this plant because it's, it's not really a plant that is really noticeable. It, it grows quite big, but it's, it's does, doesn't have really elaborate flowers. It's, it's just green and brownish. But it's really nice to make that connection between seeing that we, woman spinning her own wool and then uh, a year later finding this plant underneath her balcony. <clears throat> uh, Mediterranean hair grass is uh, actually quite small grass that also is a plant that, that came from the Mediterranean in, in wool. So it didn't travel such a great distance, but still it's, it's, it's quite an, a nice find. It's really prolific here in the, in the Schilderswijk. Also considered quite rare because it likes really warm and sandy places and we don't have uh, in many of those uh, uh, places in in Holland, great part of the of the country is clay and and uh, peat, so uh, it's 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 really a, a plant that is uh, yeah mainly found in urban areas. So you can see that urban areas are really a a, a place for plants to um, yeah to 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 cover ground and, and find new places to, 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 to grow. A really nice, and I also already told a, a little bit about it, a uh, way for plants to travel is, uh, is in wheel arches. And actually uh, on this car on the right, who has, which has been standing from quite some time, you can see uh, this and other species of Serastrium growing in the wheel arch uh, to illustrate the fact that plants can travel into wheel arches. And um, uh, actually the, the ethnic diversity of the neighborhoods also contributes to plants uh, traveling into wheel arches because you have uh, very strong family bonds uh, uh, in, in, the, in the neighborhood, but uh, people, uh, families are, are spread all over Europe. And when it's, for example, Ramadan, you can see a lot of people uh, from Spain, from Germany, from Belgium, and they all come here to visit family and they all come in their cars. That's their way of traveling. They never travel by planes of, or, or by, by uh, uh, a train, but they mainly travel by cars. And they park their car somewhere and they leave it for the uh, for the duration that they're here. And the seats, the, the the mud that's in the wheel arches dries out and that falls to the ground. And that way, uh, you get plants uh, that that uh, yeah that 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 can grow in between this, uh, this the pavement as well. And also, a lot of people tend to travel with their car to Morocco or Turkey. And um, uh, they they tend to bring uh, uh, plants over here like this uh, uh, little pot false flux uh, is also the first one found in 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 Holland here in the Schilderswijk. It's also a plant that tends to 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 grow uh, on um, on the side of roads, so it's it's very easily picked up by 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 wheels of cars and just slung into the wheel arches. 
And uh, uh, the same goes for this uh, Tanacetum coribosum. That's a, that's a plant that actually originates from uh, Mor Morocco, Morocco. And uh, it's also a first for Holland. <laughs> Uh, and uh, yeah, this is this is also a plant that probably uh, I'm not really sure, but probably got here uh, into uh, this country by wheel arches. That's very uh, a very nice way for plants to travel as well. Uh, yes, seed mixtures. That's quite interesting. We we are really concerned with bees and insects here in Holland. And uh, we try to uh, create uh, a really nice environment for them by uh, sowing a lot of seeds for more biodiversity. But there's a, a big drawback uh, to uh, many of these seeds mixtures. In, in, in Den Haag, they, they switch to very diverse seed mixtures, uh, which is a good thing. Uh, but uh, for example, things you can find uh, in the seeds mixer or uh, mixtures are, uh, for example, crow vetch. Um, these all are all plants that we normally do not find in this area. These are all plants that we find in uh, the eastern part of our country and uh, alongside the rivers, uh, like uh, 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 this one common uh, Corn crockle is a plant that is nowadays only found in, in the south <coughs> east of the country. <coughs> and um, this is uh, uh, Tragopodon pratensis uh, orientalis. And this is a very, um, it's very interesting story about this plant, which very well illustrates the, the dangers by using seed mixtures. When I started collecting plants here, this uh, uh, variation uh, was actually very rare. And uh, they started uh, with, with sowing these seed mixtures and they used a lot of uh, seeds of this uh, subspecies of uh, Tragopodon. And I actually uh, observed our normal tragopodon disappear in favor of this subspecies, which normally is very rare here in Holland and is uh, mainly found in southern and eastern Europe. And uh, we tend to forget that uh, biodiversity is not only on the outside of the plants, but also on the inside of these plants. So it's very important for plants because they just uh, grow somewhere and they have to cope with the conditions they, uh, they, they, where they are growing, that the genetic diversity inside of the plants um, is very diverse. That gives them the opportunity to find it. it it's actually just like a library. You can read and they can find a solution in, uh, in their uh, genetics. And uh, in the beginning, when they started uh, uh, with these seed mixtures, these seed mixtures mainly came from Eastern Europe and they were very uh, uh, genetically, uh, they were not very genetically diverse. So if an illness or something gets in these plants, they don't have uh, a, a great deal of resistance uh, against uh, diseases. And, uh, you actually see in these uh, tragopodons now an, a, a very uh, big outbreak of a fungus that uh, eats the flowers before they open up. It's a very rare fungus normally in, in, in Holland, but uh, these tragopodons that they introduce don't seem to have any resistance to them. So uh, the sowing of seeds can be very uh, can can look very uh, very nice and very uh, that you are doing really something for um, um, the biodiversity, but it's also a, a very tricky thing. You have to really take care where you buy your seeds if they're genetically diverse, and if you're not uh, sowing a lot of uh, plants that are uh, and seeds of plants that are already in the vicinity of where you're uh, sowing the seeds, because that can really disrupt. 
the genetics of the local population. Well, then we come to the climate uh, migrants. Uh, with the changing of climates, we, we see a lot of plants uh, creeping up further and further northward. There are a lot of uh, cranes bills actually that are, uh, uh, are coming uh, to the north. And one of them uh, uh, is the hedge uh, row crane bill. And uh, it's actually a, a, a plant that likes a chalky ground. And we don't have a really lot of chalky ground in Holland. But underneath the pavement, pavement we tend to use sand that we uh, get from the sea. So there are a lot of shellfish in there. And um, uh, that way, this plant has found a place in our cities to, to actually uh, yeah, to, 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 to grow there. And it's, it's, it's in, this, in the city, it's quite common uh, at the moment. Uh, this is actually another species of uh, species of Trachapodin, uh, the, the Western Celsi. And this is a plant that mainly has followed the route of uh, uh, train uh, tracks. It's a very beautiful plant. It's a little bit uh, paler and, 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 and more delicate than, than the other Trachapodon species I, I've, I've, showed, I've showed you. And uh, this, this plant actually came from uh, the north of France and it just traveled across the, the, the railway tracks through the north and uh, it's, it's now quite happily living here in the city. Uh, that's, that's yeah. So that's that's a way for plants to travel as well. Uh, the four-leafed allseed is also a plant from southern Europe that grows in between uh, uh, rock cracks over there. We only find it in the cities, and actually in Holland they found the most northern uh, uh, growth place uh, in Europe. It's in Groningen, in, in totally in the north of, north of Europe. And um, when I started uh, uh, investigating the neighborhood, it was still very rare. But now, actually, there is not a street in the neighborhood where it doesn't grow. It's very delicate, very small, but very beautiful plant. And uh, when it gets dry, it tends to get all pink, yellowish. And uh, it's really, yeah, it's a really beautiful plant as well. And uh, yeah, it's quite common now nowadays in the city. Yes, pot adventis, and that has a lot of to do with our need for olive trees. We want to extend our holidays that we have in Italy to our own gardens. And a lot of these uh, olive trees come from um, from southern Europe, but I understood there's even olive trees are imported from Florida <laughs> over here to Holland. And uh, yeah, if you have a big pot with an olive tree in it and a lot of soil around it, then plants can, 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 can uh, seeds can fall in there and plants can travel all the way to, from Florida uh, uh, to, to Holland. For ex and a good example of this is the, uh, is the Pennsylvanian cutweed. It actually doesn't grow in, in, in Pennsylvania, but more uh, in, the, in, in the south and middle of, uh, of America. And this is an example of a plant that came here in uh, olive tree pots that we've imported from Florida all the way to Holland to put them in a garden. I cannot imagine that it, it, it actually is, is yeah, that, that, that you can make money of importing <laughs> olive trees all the way from Florida to Holland, but who am I? <laughs> uh, but this is actually a plant from America that travels here in, um, in, the, in the pots of, uh, of uh, olive trees. Another plant that's, uh, that, that came from uh, olive tree pots is, is the hidden bittercress, and actually this is a plant that was not noticed for a long time because it resembles the small bittercus very much. And um, it's just, I think, about seven years ago that it was first noticed. Uh, 
and uh, it was so prolific everywhere that that we 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 think it has been here for decades, but it was never noticed because it's it's yeah it resembles the small bitter crisps. It's, it's a very common plant over here uh, so much and. Yeah, once you once you know the differences, it's very hard. It's very easy to 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 see the difference, but you have to look really look uh, quite careful at it to see those differences. So you can see that plants are sometimes completely overlooked and grow happily here for for many years before we discover them. Uh, the same goes in 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 in. in uh, in essence, for the uh, least yellow sorrel, it resembles uh, the normal yellow sorrel very much. It's somewhat smaller, but the, uh, the biggest difference is is in the in the flower. It only has um, um, how you call it uh, uh, five um, stems with the, the pollen on it in respect to the uh, yellow sorrel who has 10. So you have to really have your magnifying glasses ready because the flowers are only a half centimeter big and count uh, the amount of, of um, uh, pollen stems in, inside of the flower. But it, it, we don't really know how long it has been here, but we also think that it's it has been here for quite some time, but uh, was never noticed and it's still pretty rare but uh, the growth conditions here are just at the limits of its possibilities it's a little bit too cold over here then we come to something that is a little bit related to the pot advent adventus and that are the pot flatlings and uh, those are the plants that we normally put on our balconies or uh, in, in, in pots of, in front of our house. And due to climate change, we tend to find more and more of these plants just growing wild. A good example of this is the woodland tobacco. It's quite a big plant, so it's, it's, it's very often um, uh, removed by people if it's growing uh, in front of their door or in front of their windows. Uh, but sometimes it's, it, it, it crops up in a place where it can, can come to, to, to bloom and also can create seeds and then it will really happily maintain itself. Just uh, as the ornamental bacopa, it's also a plant that we have in pots a lot, a lot of the time. And that we find very much, uh, very often in, 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 in the cities as well. So this is also a bit of um, a bit of the same thing as as, as garden fledglings. We collect plants because because they're beautiful, and then we uh, we put them in pots. And because of the climate change, they can just happily grow here. Uh, like this uh, petunia I found somewhere growing uh, uh, on the street. And I find petunias quite often uh, these days. Yes, and then we have the honeybee craze. Um, just as with uh, biodiversity, we have been very uh, concerned about the honeybees. Uh, and uh, we're Tend, we tend to try to do a lot of uh, things for them. And um, we use a lot of uh, seed mixtures. And uh, I've been quite, I, I've become a little bit of an expert on bee seed mixtures. So I can, I, I can uh, recognize uh, by via the species, I find uh, what kind of seed mixture has been used. This is uh, white mustard. And that's a plant that is uh, used a lot in the Tübinger Bay mix, the Tübinger bees mix. And uh, this is actually a plant that's already has already been uh, was already mentioned in the Bible. So it's a plant that has been in culture for a very long time. The seeds are actually used to make mustard uh, out of. 
and it was also cultivated in 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 the northwestern part of Holland to make mustard out of it. But the conditions in 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 those times weren't that favorable for the plant. So so it, when the mustard production uh, stopped a little bit, it 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 uh, it tended to disappear. But now it's it's made a remarkable comeback because everybody is 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 just throwing seed bombs over uh, everywhere for the for the bees. Uh, the Lacey Facelia is, is, is also a plant that is used as a, a fertilizer, green fertilizer, but is also in a lot of bee mixtures. It's in Holland, it's also called uh, bees bread. So uh, it's this because it's a staple food for honeybees. And uh, uh, buckwheat is also in, uh, in these mixtures. Uh, it's 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 a very it doesn't do a lot of harm, but the, the downside to these mixtures for bees is that wild bees they don't uh, the, the plants don't contribute a lot to to making uh, places more favorable for uh, for wild bees. So if you don't have any honeybees uh, in the vicinity, uh, it it doesn't really contributes a lot if you use these seed mixtures but it it makes for for nice plants in the neighborhood and then i think this is the last uh, way for plants to travel and that's quite a new uh, a new uh, phenomenon and uh, we call them roof fledglings and uh, because of climate change, we are starting to put uh, soil and uh, plants on top of our roofs. And uh, because of the uh, great amounts of rainfall that we are having now at this moment as well in Holland, we're trying to um, uh, use roofs to uh, store uh, uh, water for uh, a period of time so that it, it, it doesn't get onto the streets and into the rivers that quickly. And there are a lot of plants we use on those roofs, uh, but they also flee from those roofs. So sometimes you have a, 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 an abundance of, of, uh, of these plants, and sometimes they're also endemic, like this uh, gold moss stone crop. It's, it's, it was originally an, 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 an endemic plant, but we find them now so often, and often we find them on places where uh, we have green roofs. Just like this white strong crop, you can see here that there are all these red little dots on the right uh, picture. They're all of white stone crop, and I've made this picture uh, at a, a gas station not far, far from my house, which has a green roof, and they're actually spread all around there, those little uh, white stone crops. They can sow themselves, so they can create seeds and then uh, uh, spread that way. But uh, mainly they uh, are spread when it's very dry and, and sometimes windy. Then little leaves and, and pieces of the plant break off and they just roll off the, the roof, get on a favorable place. And then, um, yeah, then they uh, grow happily in between the, the stones and they can be quite... Uh, there can be quite large numbers of these plants locally, so it's uh, that's 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 quite nice as well. Well, and then um, we come a little bit to the conclusion of our um, of my little uh, story, and I want to thank uh, my publishers Yolanda Bos and Monica Beukenholt for their. A marvelous work that they did on my book and also the province of uh, South Holland where I live and the municipality of Den Haag to contrib contributing to, to, to this book and, uh, and funding it and uh, supporting my research. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Vic. That was fascinating. Uh, you know, an extraordinary um, story. I mean, Irish Mountains Kilda's Vic is probably more uh, plant rich than many urban areas, but in a way, it's also probably really quite typical. You know, once you get your eye in on um, 
these cracks in the pavings, it's surprising what you see. And of course, most of what you've got there are ruderals, I mean, short-lived ruderals. So presumably, uh, you know, if you were to carry on, uh, you would probably find a sort of, I mean, would you expect to find really major population changes over time, species becoming extinct, new ones coming in? Um, well, there are several species which I expect that 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 are are really here to stay, and uh, I think if if climate change uh, continues, then then we can see a, a great deal of change in 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 our botany, and we can find we will find many of these plants that are now in urban areas, also in the countryside. Uh, but it really depends on how we how we are going to behave in the future if we're going to <laughs> to put in an effort to to stop this climate change. Mm. But I think that um, it's if if you see how fast the climate is changing now, so uh, in 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 non-urban areas, mm -hmm. um, that it's that it's very hard for plants to keep up with it because a lot of plants they they don't have the capacity to travel great distances on their own. Uh, so I think in in a sense that that um, uh, all these ways of travel I I've discussed uh, now can be can contribute in the future for uh, uh, to to plants coming to the uh, to the north mm -hmm. and. Uh, Actually, can help to 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 uh, keep uh, a quite a, a, a diverse flora as well. Yeah. So yeah. it's 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 worrying in a sense that 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 so many uh, new plants are are, are uh, establishing themselves here. But it's also it may also be necessary because we well, need yes yes we have something mm. yeah yeah so that's 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 yeah that's. And only one of them, I, I think, you really flagged up as a problem, and that's the uh, the Japanese knotweed, which is yeah. um, uh, quite extraordinary how widely spread across Europe that is. A part of that is from Portugal, uh, where we have otherwise a total playground for the most horrific alien invasives imaginable. Yeah. I mean, mimosa is just unbelievable. Um, but I mean, Japanese knotweed has been flagged up as sort of mimicking oak woodland in that because yeah. it starts to grow quite late. Uh, things like bluebells and violets and primroses can, but can in fact grow beneath it. So if you wanted to be yeah, sort of yeah. the for it, it, it does allow for you know, some uh, ecology, whereas you know, the really bad invasive aliens, which are really that's a very few, to eliminate. Yeah. Yeah, no, no I, 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 there are a lot of people who are very concerned about uh, exotic and, and new plants coming in, as, and, and sometimes uh, it is a problem, but nature always tries to, uh, to get a diverse, uh, di di tries to diverse, diversify itself, because that's, that's uh, more healthy, there's a lot, lot less risk for disease. So you see a lot of these plants that new plants that are coming in, they just integrate into into yeah. our, uh, flora that's already here. Mm, mm, mm. And uh, there, there, there are several problems with several uh, several plants, and uh, that are mainly plants that uh, we don't have uh, a, an, 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 an equal plant like that in, in inside of that niche area. Oh, yes, yes. So if you have a plant that is that is for example, uh, if you have a tree that that really grows very vigorously on on on, uh, on very dry so soil, for example, in the dunes over here, we yeah. don't have an equal, so that tree yeah. tends to take over uh, great areas, and then it can become a problem. Yeah. Yes, a lot of these plants over time, you 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 see that it really yeah. explodes, and over time it diminishes because mm. it's yes. not natural to have. A monoculture, so no, that's right. No, and, and, and yeah, we just have to, in some cases, be be patient. Yeah, great, marvelous, good work. We had some nice comments in from our veteran viewer Wendy Hilty. Thank you so much, Victor, for a fascinating talk and one that should be germane to all areas of the world with our increasing global connections. Um, so, well, thank you very much. Uh, we'll put this recording up now, and you know, a lot more people will will see it. Um, a lot of people out making the most of light evenings at the moment. Um, anyway, Marvis, thank you so much and uh, look forward to meeting you perhaps when I next come. Yeah, that's really nice. <laughs> okay, Great. bye everyone. <laughs> thank you. Bye -bye. Bye.